Okay, let's go. Uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about whole ex exam two. Uh, I don't have the uh, the uh, clicker stuff. Usually, I get the clicker stuff graded first, and the Scantron. But the Scantron came in about one o'clock this afternoon. Uh, I don't know how many people have bloopers on it or not, but I do know this: three people aced the Scantron, uh, unlike last time. Uh, so that's good. I, I I didn't look to see who it was, but. And uh, what I'll do is release those scores in uh, uh, after class or something. I've just swamped with, with work. Um, but before we do that, I want to mention about the true actual development of Einstein's <coughs> famous equation e equals mc squared. We alluded to this historical development that not many people know about, except it was in this cartoon here. And here's a color version. And here's what the cleaning lady is saying. Yes, sir, squared away. Anyway. But, you know, it's the thing about it is it's, it really is true. This probably didn't happen, but it really is true that uh, a lot of guys, a lot of times when you're working on research, you really don't know what you're doing. It's not that you're flailing, but you're, and it's not that you're blind, but you don't know You don't know everything. You're trying to figure stuff out, but you don't know everything. Here's another famous uh, cartoon about Professor Einstein. This is from a, a cartoon strip called The Far Side, which hasn't been in the papers for a long time. Here's a colorized version. Time actually is money. Notice that on both of these cartoons. Look at this one. This one. And this one here. There's a, cl there's a big chalkboard, and they're wear he's wearing, Einstein never wore a white lab coat, but he does in these cartoons. And there's always a clock on the wall for some reason at like 1035 or something. Look at this one. See, it's the same time. It must be some cosmological significant significance for that time of day, 1035. Here's another one about Einstein flailing. Yeah. The first two, yeah. The first two were by Gary Larson. This one's by another famous cartoonist. He's still uh, writing. Sidney Harris e equals AC squared. No, MA squared, MB squared. So he's the object of many cartoons. All right, exam two comments. We had this one, the dropped ring example, and, and we actually worked on it on Monday. And I used the same basic situation except I gave you positions and uh, distances a little bit differently um, and uh, this one the the uh, induction question after it passes position one which is get my cursor over here right here this is position one uh, he starts to catch uh, more inward rings so the induced current wants to produce outward and therefore uh, the induced current 
is uh, counterclockwise. Now, I haven't seen what your guys' performance on that is, but I'm going to look at it. As I, I, I don't even have the printouts or anything yet. I just, I, I took a quick look and uh, I saw that a couple of people crushed it, which is good. Okay, the concentric rings problem. Um, well, I don't have my animations timed right. Uh, current one was uh, counterclockwise producing outward. So the induced uh, current was uh, inward, which means clockwise. Um, and I have my pictures kind of blooped up. The solenoid brain burner started with a simple calculation. Uh, and you had the formula for the solenoid central field uh, in matching. And I think most of you got that. But then I asked you, um, as the, the, you know, the, the calculation of the solenoid was fairly basic. There wasn't even any division in it. Uh, but the, the uh, direction of the, di of the field outside of the dipole uh, was uh, a little bit trickier. And what you want to think about is the dipole field. Now, the solenoid is technically not a really nice dipole, but it does have a shape uh, like a dipole field. So the dipole field, here's the, here's the rings. Yeah, so from the positive part of the capacitor around to the negative, so, you, so your, uh, your, uh, your I1 is uh, counterclockwise, so I2 is clockwise on that one. And here's, here's a picture of, uh, and this one's the central field is going to the left. And the basic idea is, you know, a solenoid is basically a stack of dipoles. So it's kind of a dipole field, but elongated through the middle. It's got a, and that's the stretch where we like right in here, where we like to put equipment uh, because uh, uh, that's where the magnetic field is uh, fairly uniform. But outside here, it's going the opposite way. So if the central field is going left, then outside here, it's going right because they loop around. Fields loop around. And uh, I was talking with a student um, about this. Um, and you know what another tricky one was? The one where you have six different kinds of magnets and you had to choose out a pair that were similar. And the thing about it was I burned a lot of your brains. I didn't intend to do it this way. I didn't intend that to burn many brains. But there was, there was a lot of uh, pairings that I could have put together, but I didn't. Like the geomagnetic field of the Earth and a dipole loop, a, a simple loop of wire. A lot of you guys, that was number one and number two. And, and some of you guys said, Dr. B, where? it's not on there. But something else was on there. Uh, so a solenoid wasn't on there. But Now, here's the velocity selector. Oh, oh, looks like my animation. Let me see if I can clean that up. Hold on a second. I don't want this to be all blooped up. Okay, so the equilibrium condition for this one is that the magnetic force uh, and the electric force balance. In other words, they add up to zero. And we know that. It, it means that one of them's up or down, the other one's down or up. Um, the electric field is downward, uh, so that means the electric force on a positive particle is downward. And therefore, you want magnetic force going upward. So you want uh, you want some V cross B like this, some inward V cross B. Here's the balance equation: QVB magnetic equals QE. The charges cancel. 
and you get this expression v equals v times b equals e uh, and your objective was to actually do this computation down here uh, which uh, I saw some unusual round-offs. I haven't graded this one yet, but I'll look at everybody's answer. And if it's close to uh, the correct answer, now there's the correct answer in Tesla's. All right. And that's where you're going to get, that's where you're going to get uh, if you, um, just use the numbers that we got. Now, I asked you to convert into uh, Gauss for this reason. For this reason, that I, I didn't want you to type in a number with a leading zero, because if you, if you just, if you try to get a decimal, if you forget to put a zero in, and then you just try to put in point oh two oh two eight. um, uh, the clicker won't let you do that. A calculator would, but not the clicker. So that's why I had you convert. So here are the conversion factors. This is a conversion factor on the front, and this is equivalent, 10 to the 4 Gauss. So whatever number of Teslas you have, multiplied by 10 to the 4, and you'll get Gausses, and that's uh, 202.8. Uh, raise your hand if you remember getting that, 202.8. Good. And I know a few of you had something a little bit... Um, uh, different from that. I saw some 202s that were not 202.8. But I'll look. I'll look at everybody's great, everybody's, you know, answer. And... All right. Uh, any additional questions? Go ahead. Oh, the clicker question before that uh, was, uh, I can't remember that. that the, I know the answer was C, but I can't remember. Yeah, you guys have it. I don't have it. Uh, question. Um. The question was, there's no way to get it full credit unless you put 202.8. Uh, depends. That's why I look at them all. You know, like if I see somebody with 202.8 and they couldn't find the decimal, or they thought they had the decimal point, I might give them full points or, or two points or something. We'll see. I'll look at it. Uh, Brittany, did you still have a question? No? You good? All right. Uh, see, I dinged both of you at the same time up there. I used to have a class with three Jennifers in it, and it was in a small classroom, and I had a seating plan, seating chart. So one time I put them all three right next to each other, you know, one, two, three. And then when I said, and you know how I do, I always call on names. And I said, Jennifer, and they all <laughs> looked like that. I caught them napping, three at a time. All right, homework. Uh, a couple things I want to review with you about homework. And I know a few of you have, have messaged me about it in web courses. I'm trying to synchronize the grades from Wiley Plus myself. And so it, and it's, uh, what I'm doing is downloading a spreadsheet of the Wiley Plus grades, and they're all in there, you know, whatever you have. As you know, you know the grades are in there for your work. And I can download that, and then what I've been doing is uh, stuffing that into a, a new uh, row of your grade book. Now, uh, and I'm, I'm not done with that. I think I, I think I have a little bit more work on that task, but um, so I made some new rows and hopefully they're right next to the original. If, for instance, uh, tiny circuit homework, 
uh, from Wiley Plus is known as tiny conversion. And homework six from Wiley Plus is no, known as HW6 conversion. And then the chapter 22, this is the one that's still blooped up a little bit, uh, because some uh, chapter 22 practice, uh, which was due uh, yesterday, I guess, right? Due, due the day of the exam. Uh, that um, some of you didn't do the first attempt, you started with the second attempt, and which is all right. Uh, but I wasn't looking at the second attempt, so I'm gonna I gotta do another cycle of this stuff, and that's the one that says combination. All right, I'm also changing the baseline grade, and from here on out, I, I've noticed that it that uh, if if I don't if there's a question, like a multiple choice, or a, like a, a calculation question, you know, like from the tiny circuit homework, there was the one question where you had to do about four currents and four voltages, and they had to do them again, or something like that, and you ended up with, it was actually 14 different decisions you had to make for that one problem, I think. And so that should have been 14 points, but it wasn't. It was one point. Uh, so uh, I'm going to try to, in future Wiley Plus, I'm going to make sure that I give all those uh, problems the right amount of pointage, you know, for each decision. Okay, so a multiple choice question will still be one point, but like that one tiny circuits homework, I, I, I didn't make it uh, 14 points, but I should have done that. And so the tiny assignment, I thought it was tiny, but it's, it was, you know, a little bit bodacious. But anyways, it was, should have been a little bit bigger. Now, the other thing, I was on their chat line last night. I was trying to get all this stuff done last night, but no. I found, and this is what the, the problem was. I had to go on the chat, online chat with Wiley Plus, and they said, well, yeah, you can readjust the scoring for any of the homeworks that you want. You know, so I can, I can go back to that one problem and set it to be a 14-point problem. And, but, he, but he said, but if you do that, it resets all the students. And yeah, so in other words, and I think that's what, that's how I torched a lot of your guys' grades on some of the Bernoulli homework, which is why I had to cut all that stuff out. So I'm going to leave the, the Wiley Plus assignments alone for now. And, uh, but the future Wiley Plus homeworks, which I might give you another one over the weekend, uh, I'm going to try to get it so that it's, you know, if it's 14 point, one question for 14 points, it reflects that. Now let's take a look at some of the other stuff. This is uh, C22 combination. Um, I, have to, I have to redo that one. Um, so if you see the word conversion next to a score or a combination, then that's the one that we're going to use to tally up your grades because they're just not sinking. You know what? I, I looked at it last night. That there were 456 misfires in, you know, in the grade refresh. And that was two weeks ago. If I do a grade refresh now, it'll probably be over a thousand. And so they, and I, I don't think they know what to do. So I'm just, I just decided to take the bull by the horn. But you know, I have other homework scores, or there's other homework scores in there. So we don't just have Wiley Plus. We have, you know, we have written homework, and then, then we have that one in web courses, extra electric field practice. So, but hopefully this will start making sense to you. And um, I hope to have an example tomorrow in lecture of putting it all together. So I'm going to try to get the Wiley Plus stuff squared away tonight and then do a homework scores subtotal as of uh, July 18th. And then kind of, and we'll also have, hopefully by that time, we'll also have exam two grade on the book. So we'll actually be able to give you um, some data uh, for a full scale um, grade.
clicking homework to exams. And so you'll see how it all, oh, but you know the other thing that I want to mention, a student came in and asked me, you know, about the lab grade and, and what you guys don't, might not realize is that the lab grade, you're going to probably, most of you, I understand in a normal semester, you're going to clean house and you're going to get, you know, like 95% or even 100%. Raise your hand if you have 100% on labs right now. A few of you. Raise your hand if you have 90 or higher. Yeah, see, that's... So you guys are going to... You're guys going to have a... a bun, I'm going to convert that into pointage. And it's 18 and change. And so technically, that 95% is going to be a little bit bigger grade than a midterm because the midterms are what 16 percent or something under the new scheme uh so and so you guys got that coming in but you don't have it yet because you won't have it till the end of the semester just like homework and clicking you won't have till the end of the semester but um that lab grade and, and plus we we also have keep the best three drop the lowest all right, so you get, to, you get to drop one stinky grade. If you still have one stinky grade in there, um, then that uh, your lab grade hopefully will come to the rescue like the cavalry, all right, and, and help you out grade-wise. But I also want to mention something else. The stuff that we're going to start today in chapter 24 uh, is going to be a little bit, it's cooler stuff in my opinion, but it's not as fancy dancy with mathematics and stuff. You know what the, you know what the, big, uh, the big heart of the beast was? Uh, chapter 21. With all those magnets and magnetic fields and coils and stuff. And all those machines, you know, the velocity selector, the mass spectrometer, all that stuff. Boy, that was the heart of the beat. That was the most detailed math uh, that we've had. Chapter 24, you're going to feel like, whew, I feel light on my feet. You know, it's going to be, because there's not many equations to, to tackle that we're actually going to use to calculate stuff. All right, so here's a, here's a close-up of your grade page. You can see these ones. Uh, BB18 conversion, that's brain burners, chapter 18, brain, brain burners. FLC, field line concepts, conversion. RA19, uh, reading ahead in chapter 19, conversion. And then homework six, conversion. All right, so here's, so there's the homework six. And a lot of you, uh, right now, you have Jack over here just like this uh like this individual but i can look it up in in basically in uh .com and then figure out what to to give you down here so uh, all is not lost but it's going to take a little bit of time here's another one uh here's the tiny tiny basic circuitry homework and it's, so the one that, you know, tiny conversion is the one that I'm going to use to cal and I want you to use to calculate, you know, where you are in your grades and stuff. All right. So, uh, so we'll be doing that with the rest of the grades. We're going to, I refuse to let Wiley dot, I can't do anything about Canvas. It's Canvas's way or the highway, but Wiley.com is not going to defeat Thomas Brickner. Okay. Uh, concepts. Uh, get your clickers ready. We have a clicker question coming. Uh, what is it? You know, you might have seen this in your reading. RMS voltage. RMS current. Uh, what does that mean? Root means square. RMS means root means square. Uh, we're going to talk about RMS as a concept in the context of dissipation of energy 
in a plain old circuit with a voltage and a resistor and some current. All right, so let me just remind you that um, a little bit of charge, delta Q, dropping through a voltage, rising through a voltage, uh, it gives you the amount of work done on that charge. All right, so the work done is delta Q times V, whatever V is, you know, and it could be, you know, uh, a, an oscillating uh, voltage for, you know, an AC circuit, alternating current. But whatever it is, it's delta. So the rate of at which work is done, in other words, the power, uh, which hopefully you studied a little bit in 2053, uh, is just that stuff above divided by delta T. So if you move, Julia, if you move a little bit of delta Q through a voltage in a time delta T, this is the average power. Okay, that's the rate of, at which work is done in that resistance, all right? And so um, let me just ask you a mental IQ test question here. Now we got, you know, so the power, delta Q times V divided by delta T. Do you see uh, current in there? Don't say anything if you see it. You see it? All right, let's do, let's do a question together. Click your question, number one. Hopefully, you guys are geniuses. Douglas Dittman, you got it? Did you click? Good. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Three, two, one, zero. Um, yeah, you guys are geniuses. 73% uh, of you got that right. Yeah, it's just, if you, you know, just go back. There it is right there, delta Q over delta T. You know, so it's I times V, or V times I, uh, which is what we got here. Now, don't forget, there's one thing about this. Uh, Ohm's law says that V is equal to IR, right? In a regular old circuit like that, V equals IR. Uh, so that means that power is actually uh, also expressible as I squared times R. And that, my wonderful student students, is a phrase that uh, lives forever in the mind of an electrical engineer, I squared R heating. I squared, any circuit that's got a resistance and is, and is carrying some current, is gonna, the more current you put through there, the square of that gives rise to the, the heat dissipation. So for instance, something like this, I square heating, in a, a light bulb filament, yeah, they, that's how they, they that's how they work. They um, they uh, dissipate so much energy just getting through the filament. It's higher resistance. It conducts, but it's it's not a very good conductor. It's got a lot of resistance. They put some voltage behind it, and if they get the wire just the right size and they you know and everything and they're just the right voltage. It'll start, it'll get so hot it glows. Here's another example. Um, in, your, in your kitchen at home, if you have an electric stove, you know, those babies get pretty hot when you turn the electricity on. And they're made with a certain, I think it's a ceramic. Um, no, they're, 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 
they're lined with ceramic, but they have a certain kind of a conductor in those coils that um, is, you know, going to produce a lot of I squared R heating. All right, another word for this um, is joule heating, J-O-U-L-E, joule heating. But, you know, one of my best friends is an electrical engineer, and uh, I squared R heating is... So if you have a friend uh, that is an electrical engineer and you see him working on some circuit, you know, like some circuit homework or anything like that, just ask him, what's the I squared R heating in that? And they'll think, well, how did they, how did they know about that? Because if they're working on any kind of circuitry here or anything, it's an issue. You know, here's another, here's another factor. You know, upstairs in the, in the second floor, this is the first floor down here, the second floor, the mall, the math something learning lab. You know, they got Buku computers up there, right? And all those computers are making heat. I squared our heating out the wazoo. And that's why they got to crank the air conditioning down to the MAX in this building. Otherwise, those computers would turn this whole building into a, a sweat box. And, you, and it used to be that this room in the summer especially was really cold. And my TAs would bring blankets and pillows to class and those those little things that you see on the infomercials, uh, what are they called? Snugglies. The students, the, 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 it was astronomy class, and the newbie freshmen were bringing those just to give me the business. But it's, it's a little bit better this summer. It's not so, so cold. Now, I want to go through this idea of RMS. And here's a, a simple circuit. Now, this one's AC. So we got um, alternating current. Um, and the current graph is this red one down here. So up here at B prime, uh, the current is on the positive side of the uh, vertical axis. So that means it's going around clockwise. And then over here, you know, the circuit's negatory over here um, at this dip in the red curve. Uh, so that means it's going counterclockwise. And then it's back to clockwise over here at this next bump in the red curve, uh, so that means uh, clockwise again. And that's what, you know, that's alternating current. And the formulas for these, uh, for a real um, um, alternating current, is usually sinusoidal. And this one happens to be uh, sine of two pi times the frequency times time. Now, if you remember from oscillators and stuff, simple harmonic oscillators, springs, the frequency uh, has units of seconds to the minus one. So seconds to the minus one times seconds is a unit. It doesn't have any dimensions. So this, um, and you know, it's a sine function. A sine is a function uh, of, a, of a pure number, all right? Somewhere between zero and two pi in the radian system, and then it repeats. Um, so anyway, so this is, the, uh, this is the function for the voltage. It starts at zero as the sine does. You know, the sine of zero is zero. And then it gets tall over here. And point B, the first bump is um, one quarter of the way. But better make a, note, make a sketch of this and just add a few notes if you're a little rusty on your frequencies and wavelengths. The top of this bump is uh, a quarter of the way through the cycle. Okay, now this first, this first zero point here that's halfway through the first cycle, all right? And notice that C and C prime are at the same instant of time. You know, the graphs are different, but they're in step. Now here, this dip in the uh, voltage, the blue voltage curve, that's three quarters of the way through the cycle. And then all the way at the end of the first cycle, it's back here at zero, all right? And then it does an identical cycle. And if it's a good generator, it'll make really, really good signs uh, till the cows come home. 
Same thing down here. So this will be the resulting current in that thing. And the important thing is peak to peak here, B prime to B, um, zero to zero, C prime to C, they're in step, okay? Now I'm gonna park this up here uh, and just make a note. And here are the actual um, sine functions. Uh, v is a function of time. V of t is uh, whatever V0 is. That's, V0 is the maximum. Uh, uh, that's what we would call the amplitude. So the top of the curve at B is V0 up, and the, the, uh, the bottom here is negative V0, in other words, V0 downward below the time axis. And here it is up, again up here at V0. And similar with the current, so I, sine, I zero sine of two pi f t, all right? Now that's for somebody that's got an AC generator hooked up to a resistor. You know, no, no uh, hot uh, concepts with this. Uh, but now I wanna talk about the power. Now the power, P is equal to I V. So the product of these Mercedes is is the power and that means that you have a function that looks like this it's actually a sine squared function all right i zero times v zero times sine squared of that same argument two pi ft all right and that's because you know in the in the in the uh, and we're trying to get rms here and we're about to strike with RMS. Now, and this is a di these are both diagrams from chapter, actually these are from chapter 20. Uh, that one on the right is from chapter 20. And I think this one over here, and this greenish one, uh, is actually chapter 23. Anyway, um, the average value here is one half. This thing spends uh, equal amounts of time above and below the average. Uh, so the average power is one half I zero V zero. And for that reason, it's, you know, the, the, the average power um, is, you know, here it is, one half I zero V zero. And you can express that as a, a product of these two numbers. Now, I don't know who the, who's the one that started using this. These are the RMS values, I0 over square root two, V0 over square root two. Here's the same function, all right? And these two babies, those are your RMSs. Okay, so you take your full amplitude and divide by the square root of two, and that's your RMS amplitude. All right, and for something like um, the power function, I zero V zero times sine squared of the argument two pi F T some, a function like that, this, and, and for the fancy uh, analysis that goes with it or that you can do with that, uh, the IR, the um, RMS is uh, come up. Uh, it's a handy, it's a handy uh, abbreviation is what it is. Uh, so s scientists have decided to use, uh, you know, shorthand I RMS uh, as I zero over square root two and so forth. All right, so it's a vocabulary term. It comes up in the context, a lot of contexts, but it, for us in the context of uh, I squared R heating. All right. So um, they're used for, in chapter 23, the reason I'm bringing it up now is that, that was chapter 20. I didn't really need to go over it in chapter 20, but now to get a little bit of the idea of the impedance to an alternating current in chapter 23, we need to use this technology, the terminology of RMS. Okay, and here's, here's how it works. You know, a capacitor is gonna resist, the more it gets charged up, the more it's going to resist being charged up. Okay, it gets harder and harder to get charged. Okay. And similar with an inductor, an inductor, you know, we know by lens, we know by Lenz's law, it's going to have, it's like having, it's like the, the inductor has inertia. 
like it has mass. So that resists the flow of current as well. So, but we don't call it a resistance. What we do is we call it a reactance. Okay, so here it is. The reactance <coughs> X <coughs> subscript C is defined with RMSs. All right, and that's because uh, our destiny is to uh, study um, alternate, well, the guy that invented this was thinking RMS. All right, now that's for a capacitor. Now, if you have an inductor, it's the same. Uh, so this looks like Ohm's law, except now we have something called a reactance, symbol is capital X, and an inductance, an inductor has a reactance. You know, like I said, you know, you think of the, the moment, or the, or you think of the mass of a system as resisting the change to the state of motion. And the inductance, or the mutual inductance, or even the self-inductance uh, of a coil uh, resists the uh, change uh, in the current. Same thing with the capacitance. Uh, so you could have a circuit that has um, an inductor or a capacitor or both. And uh, basically they both are ways to impede the flow of uh, alternating current. Now alternating current doesn't really go anywhere. You know, direct current goes somewhere. But you know, all the alternating current, you know, the electrons, the electrons are moving, you know, very slowly. Um, they're, they're shuttling back and forth and what's being transmitted is voltage. Um, at the at the end of the line. Anyways, both of these uh, quantities, the reactants, are measured in ohms. All right. And so we're gonna, and so these are. This is like this one up here. This top equation, V R M S equals I R M S times X subscript C. That's that's kind of like Ohm's law. Um, for capacitors. And this second one in the middle, VRMS equals IRMS times X subscript L, that's kind of like Ohm's law or an analog of Ohm's law for an inductance, for a coil. Now the thing about these are, um, a resistor dissipates energy, but it doesn't, it doesn't interfere with the intensity. I mean, once you get the current going, it, it just stays. If you keep the voltage the same, you know, the current will stay the same. But that doesn't work, it doesn't work that way with capacitors and inductors, coils and caps. It doesn't work that way. But resistors, it does. And here's one way to say that. There's no lag between the applied voltage and the current. All right, and this is figure 23.3. <coughs> uh, and here's a quote. In the, the two um, functions, V of T and I of T, they're in phase, which means that they increase and decrease in step uh, with each other. All right? And... Uh, that is significant because capacitors don't do that. You know, even a discharging capacitor has time dependence. Resistors don't really have a time dependence. So whatever the de time dependence of your voltage is, that's the time dependence of your current. But that's not necessarily true with a capacitor or an inductor. So um, that's what we're going to turn to now. Uh, so this is 23.3. Make a note. That's um, in your textbook. Now, let's take a look at a capacitor. Here's a capacitor. Uh, this is figure 23.4. Now, Heidi, in this one, notice that the voltage and the, um, the current, the current's red and the voltage is blue, they're out of step. And that's what happens um, in a circuit that has a capacitance. You know, there's a time dependence. 
And uh, this one, if the, if the voltage applied oscillates, the capacitor co kind of causes a delay, all right? So the way that you would say that is that these are out of step by one quarter of a cycle. Voltage and uh, current are out of step. In other words, um, the voltage has a bump, max voltage, at B, but at B prime, the current is zero, all right? So these babies are out of step by exactly one-fourth uh, of a cycle, all right? Uh, here's a quote from the book. The current in the capacitor leads the voltage, okay? So the, the current is in red, and that's maximum at the start. And the voltage across the capacitor is different. It's still zero when the, when the current is max, right? Now, that's not true in an inductor. It's a little bit different in an inductor, right, as we're going to see in a minute. But guess what, students? Whoops. There's your 90 degrees. And what we're gonna find is that that, that change from exponential de decay into sinusoidal variation, yeah, you can, start, you can start seeing the signs of it, okay? Now, here's, here's another picture that, that uh, scientists have used. Um, this is the phasor diagram. Okay, and basically, look at this one first on the right. The, if I say that the current and the voltage are out of phase by 90 degrees, I could write an arrow for voltage and an arrow for current and put a 90 degree angle between them. And then the, the actual size of the current, here's the 2 pi FT, this angle down here is, 2 pi Ft. So where, wherever the voltage is, uh, the current was 90 degrees ago. The current already went through, through this angle over here. All right? And that corresponds to this picture here. Okay, so the current is at maximum here, and 90 degrees later, the voltage is at maximum up here at B. All right? So... Um, so this is a phaser. Now here's the important point. Um, th compare this diagram over here on the right to this one. Now this one's just for a regular resistor. Just a plain old resistor, no time dependence. Whatever the time dependence of the, uh, of the uh, current is, that's what the time dependence of the um, voltage is. They're right in step, so they're in the same direction. There's no 90 degrees of separation. They don't have a quarter of a cycle separating them. All right, so whatever, you know, if, if the current is at a maximum or if the current is at sine of 2 pi Ft, um, then so is V0. But when um, the voltage is at sine of 2 pi Ft, V0 times sine of 2 pi Ft, the current was there, you know, a quarter of a cycle ago, over here on the right. But here they're in step. Now, Ohm's law, V equals IR. Now, V equals IR for a resistor is nice over here, but how do you, how do you deal with that over here? How do you deal with that 90 degrees? Well, here's V equals IR, alternating current V RMS equals IRMS times R. But for um, an alternating current and a capacitor, you know, you, you can think of, you know, the, the, uh, the capacitance is, as, um, you know, responding to, to the current um, 90 degrees away from the voltage. So what happens, um, the phasor's not needed over here, 
but it is over here. And the resistance, what is that resistance term, that big square root, what does that remind you of? Anna. Yeah. Distance, and what's, what, what's the famous name of that formula? Pythagorean theorem. Yeah. So 90 degrees, yeah, it's in there. We've got to use Pythagorean theorem. And so, the, and so that square root, um, I don't have it in my notes, but that would be called the impedance. We don't call it a resistance. It's measured in ohms, but it's not um, a resistance. We call it an impedance. It's the response, and it's, a, it's basically the length of a hypotenuse. And you know a hypotenuse is in a right triangle. And what does a right triangle have? It has a 90-degree angle in it. So this, this, um, this oscillation business is mighty interesting. Now here's what happens for, um, for an inductance. You can go ahead and just jot this down in figure 23.7. It's similar for an inductance, except in the inductance, the current lags behind the voltage. You know, for the other one, for the capacitor, it was the, uh, vo the voltage that lagged by a quarter of a cycle. All right, so if you look at 23.7, it says that uh, the current lags behind the voltage by a phase angle of 90 degrees. Now that's one way of, I would say quarter of a cycle. Or if you're thinking in terms of period, the temporal scale, Alicia, it would be uh, one quarter of a period, okay? So the voltage is ahead and the current's slacking. Um, so what that means is if you have a, if you have a circuit with, a react with an inductor and a capacitor, you there, they're 180 degrees apart. So you have to have an even fancier looking um, impedance formula. But you still have good old R squared in there. R squared, the ohmic resistor is still in there doing his job. Anyway, so the 90 degrees, this is where it comes in. Or this is another way to see where the 90 degrees comes in. Um, and we're going to use, uh, <clears throat> the reason I want to show you those functions was because when we study electromagnetic waves and so forth, which this is chapter 24 now, um, we're going to be dealing with sines and cosines of 2 pi times the frequency times the time. So, um, and I don't consider that too bodacious. Um, I hope everybody here likes sines and cosines, Pythagorean theorem, uh, and it, it, there's no right-hand rule. Uh, wait a minute, I take that back. There is a right-hand rule. Yeah, here's the right-hand rule. Here's, here's a really nice picture, 24.3. Um, this kind of grayish object over here is supposed to be a dipole antenna. You see this little symbol in the middle of it? That means um, you're, you're pushing an alternating current into the top, into the bottom. You're pushing charges. You're pushing electrons into the top, then into the bottom, then into the top, then into the bottom, then into the top, then into the bottom. And when you do that, it creates electromagnetic radiation. And far away from the source, uh, the elect see that's what this little squiggly thing is here to, to express that you're skipping through a lot of distance far away from the source you're going to get a train of waves that look like this now there's a right hand rule in, oh, oh man I thought you guys were going to be off the hook from right hand rule but there's one for this E cross B E cross curves fingertips curve down to B your thumb is the direction of propagation. All right? 
So E, that first bump, is like this, and the, B, the, B, the, the accompanying bump of the magnetic field, exactly perpendicular at every point in space, um, is, is flat. It's on the floor. So it's vertical down to the floor, and so the radiation is going this way. Uh, so go ahead and make a few notes here. Um, the wavelength, we're going to do some calculations with wavelength here after the break. Um, you can see the wavelength of the magnetic and the electric fields uh, are uh, the same. It's an oscillating system. It's almost like an inductive, it, it's like a, a, a system of... Uh, capacitance and inductance, except there's no device. It's the electric field on its own. So that disturbance, you know, the, the electric field and the magnetic field have infinite range. And so this disturbance propagates through time and space in this particular direction uh, with a wavelength. And the, the equation for it is fairly simple. Uh, but remember that E and B are parallel. Right-hand rule applies. Uh, so, um, oh, uh, those little rectangles, these little, uh, well, they're rectangles in perspective, so they look like parallelograms. Um, this, this one is in the YX plane, this kind of orangey one. And so all the, all the E vectors are in the, in this diagram anyways, are in the yx plane. They never dip over into the z's. Now the the b field, the magnetic field, is in the zx plane. Uh, so they never dip upward or downward into the y's at all. And that's figure 24-3. Now here's another picture that's kind of nice. Um, this is a antenna uh, dipole antenna receiving. So if you know you if you've got your your uh, radio on, it's, you know everybody that's got an FM enabled phone or you have a car radio, you've got some kind of antenna. It, it might not look like this, but its function is just like this. So basically, what this does is it causes electrons in the antenna to rattle back and forth at a certain frequency. And then that goes through these coils, and then, and here's your capacitor and stuff. Uh, and then um, and you tune it to the right frequency, and you pick up the signal, you know, of whatever radio station you're trying to listen to by changing the capacitance here. And then only that's, that will go through, uh, only that signal, that frequency will go through. Um, and then you, it just goes to your, you know, your speakers and stuff, and that's how you listen to stuff. All right, let's take a five-minute break, uh, and then we'll come back and do some document cam work. And then we'll dismiss. Yeah. Okay, so... We just, we just talked about this big equation. Uh, we just went to the document camp. So you're written at homework number four to be turned in tomorrow. I know it's less than 24 hours and it's gonna be available by 9 p.m. I'm gonna make it fairly simple about the wave equation and calculations and stuff. Um, so look at 9 p.m. and I'll see you tomorrow at three. Now you're dismissed.